Richard Bandler is known as the co-creator of neuro-linguistic programming. He's also developed other systems such as design human engineering and neuro-hypnotic repatterning. He's, no he's also known as the master of communication and also one of our time's geniuses of personal change. So thank you so much for joining us. A very, very warm welcome to you. Um, Richard, could you tell us what neuro-linguistic programming is? Well, neuro-linguistic programming is the study of successful behaviors and thought patterns. Uh, whereas psychology tries to find out the root cause of your difficulties, we're not really interested. We instead find people that either get over problems and find out what they did, or people that have great expertise, fine athletes, fine musicians, great artists, good spellers, find out what they do mentally and teach other people to have the same kind of success. And you've worked with uh, many of the Fortune 500 companies, such as the U.S. military and Major League Baseball teams. Yeah, I don't really think of the U U.S. military as a Fortune 500 no. company, but <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've worked with lots of big corporations, the U.S. military, baseball players, not so much teams. Okay. Uh, a lot of athletes want to perform better. They may be good at some aspects of their sport, but they may have periods where they do really well, and then they go into slumps. Generally, they call me in to get them back on track. Uh, both the skills I have with neuro-linguistic programming and as a hypnotist allow me to get people to sort of orient themselves so that they're thinking more strategically. Uh, most people's difficulties come when they're really remembering their problems as opposed to thinking about ways to solve them. Absolutely. I feel that I've had first-hand ex personal experience with you, um, and I'm somebody who's achieved personal amazing, amazing results for you. And because I've experienced that, I know how amazing NLP is, and this stuff really, really does work. But for those who are new to NLP, how can it help people overcome mental blocks such as depression, schizophrenia, and post-traumatic stress? Well, post-traumatic stress, I could take you as an example, actually. Uh, when you first talked to me, you had uh, just ridden on a bus and got off and it blew up uh, in 7-7. And uh, all you could think about when you looked at big backpacks and things was the fact that it was hard to look into the future. Uh, by getting you to reorient your thought patterns so that instead of looking at all of this unfolding the way it did, literally running it backwards in your mind, shrinking pictures smaller, Suddenly it became less important and you could think about what really was, which was your own future. So you could do new things like be on the radio. Absolutely. I, I love doing the radio and I can't thank you enough for the experience that I have. It's helped me lead a much better lifestyle and if anything, it's given me I freedom. I want to point out to your listeners about how long that took. That actually took all in all about 60 seconds. So saved you years of therapy <laughs> years and years and lots of money on therapy you've saved me so i'm eternally grateful for the experience that i've well, had you like i mean this week we had like 280 people in a course and i would say most of them had an experience that was somewhat similar to that where they got over difficulties people were afraid of spiders were holding tarantulas in their hand people who feared snakes were touching snakes people who were afraid of public speaking were getting up talking to groups of people that many of these things that get in our way don't have so much to do with the things, but the way we think about them. We're really only born with two natural fears, loud noises and falling. All the rest are learned, and if we can learn silly things like that, then we can learn something better. And I really, uh, to me, I, I'm not somebody who does therapy. I teach people how to think. And when you say neuro-linguistic programming is solved a problem, it's not all neuro-linguistic programmers know what they're doing. Just like when you go to the dentist, you've got to pick a good dentist. Absolutely. And uh, it's always a good idea for people to go online and check with the Society of NLP or purenlp.com or NLP Life Training, any of these things to find a place to get a lesson. I've actually now set up a website, uh, which is nlpqdreams.com, which has about 
Uh, I think right now we have close to a thousand lessons on there to help people to get over smoking and get more motivated. And uh, I have things. I have six mental uh, fitness tapes just to get people to be smarter. And I'm hoping this year to add things about how to multiply and how to do geometry and how to read faster and how to spell better. Wow, that's amazing. Because all of these kinds of things. Oh, yeah, you get a five-day free membership if you go online. You can For five days, you can try it out for nothing. Excellent. And if you have enough websites, you can just keep doing that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, For every email address, I think you get five days. So (laughs) given how free email addresses are, you could probably stay on there for a while. (laughs) Just create uh, different accounts. Most of my CDs that are for sale are on there. You know, the personal enhancement series, a lot of these things that teach people to design their own destiny and take control of their own thinking patterns. So rather than being at the mercy of their thoughts and their internal voices and their feelings, they can learn to manifest them on purpose, redirect their energy so that they are looking forward into the future rather than running away from an imagined future or a remembered past. So you're helping people become leaders of their own lives and giving them the freedom and the tools to actually go and do that. Well, yeah, they should be teaching people to do this in elementary school, but they're busy teaching you to spell with a system called phonetics that you can't even spell phonetically. A lot of the things they do in school, they've been doing for years and years and years. We update the software in our computers all the time. We repaint our houses, and we should do the same thing with our thought patterns. We should update and find better soft patterns, software patterns to put in our mind. If you want to be a good artist, you should know how artists are thinking about art as well as getting lessons about how to paint. You know, people who draw precisely things on the outside, imagine a hand next to them tracing them and a wire from that hand to their own so that they know exactly where to put the pencil. And they don't teach these things in art school. Uh, Sometimes people pick them up randomly, but not all of us do. And I believe we can teach more people to be successful at absolutely everything. I work with Olympic athletes, uh, not this time around, but I have in the past, to teach them better ways of thinking, to practice, to be motivated, to persevere, so that instead of you know imagining in their minds running a race at a certain speed, they can actually pace in their mind and go through and rehearse winning over and over again, which makes it more likely. I mean, if you imagine not winning, you're probably not going to. Mm. Uh, you know, many of us were trained to look for the mistakes we make in life. That's very Back true. in school, that's all they do is put a red check next to every word you misspell, every bad sentence, every uh, problem you add or divide wrong. So it teaches us to focus on what can go wrong rather than marking out what we do that's right. So we keep focusing on how much better we're getting over time. Absolutely. That's really, really amazing, amazing stuff. And there must have been people in the past, because you've worked with thousands of clients across the globe in every single country. Yeah, I've actually had well over a million people in the past four decades in seminars. I've had loads and loads of clients and demonstration subjects and all kinds of things. Uh, you know, I've, I've taught here and in Australia and, and all over Europe. And I have training institutes. I have 30 institutes in Japan alone. I have now a whole cadre of trainers all over the world that are certified and uh, that these people who are certified by my organization are people who have been trained well. Absolutely. Uh, You know, there are other people out there, but buyer beware always. You can always (laughs) check with purenlp.com or the Society of NLP. Uh, there's NLP trainers, and you can put in where you are, and they'll get you good trainers. In this country in particular, there are lots and lots of good trainers because I've worked here. I worked with Paul McKenna for years. Uh, we've trained up a whole generation of good people. In London alone, we've put over 100,000 people, not all from England, but from all over the world through trainings right here in London. That is so impressive. And and being Paul McKenna's mentor and teacher, um, from where he started out to now where he is and taking your learning and making a, a massive career out of it, helping millions across the globe, just like you've done. Yeah, Paul's a nice guy, too. I like Paul. He's a great guy. <laughs> And because you've seen thousands and thousands of clients, which would you say is your biggest challenge where you've achieved an amazing result? Well, I, to me, the most amazing result is that when I started out, you know, people 
first told me I shouldn't even be thinking about doing what I was doing. And then they said I was just being rebellious. And pretty soon I was eccentric. And now uh, they're teaching it in hospitals to doctors. They're teaching it in the military for sharpshooters and sonar people. Uh, the police use it for interrogation. Uh, the work that I've done is now everywhere. Uh, you know, and uh, I don't plan to slow down. I got a few <laughs> good years left in me. Definitely. <laughs> and and so, in terms of your the, uh, the biggest challenge that you faced, would that be with a particular client or um, working with somebody who has a particular illness or somebody who can't overcome an obstacle? Well, uh, to me, it's like it's hard to answer your question because the, my whole career was based on taking people that was given up on by everybody. Uh, most of my clients had been through everything. They'd had psychiatrists and electric shock treatments, and they'd been drugged or whatever, and finally some people threw their hands up and threw them to me. Mm. So they were all a challenge. But to me, when I look at something that hasn't been done, to me that's where I get to learn something new. They give me a big, fat case history. It's really a list of all the things that have been tried that don't work. So I know I'm going to have to do something else. And whether it was a psychiatric client or some people who had su suffered severe neurological damage, and uh, we had to find a new way for their brain to work to be able to live a better life. And, you know, uh, certainly, you know, you don't achieve perfection with a client. They don't end up, end up appearing totally normal. You don't take somebody who's been obsessive compulsive for 20 years and get them to not obsess. You just switch what they obsess about. If they obsess about being happy and productive, uh, then they go out of their house and they do things and they live better. You know, uh, if you can get somebody that has a freaky feeling if they try to throw something out who hoards too much uh, to get a freaky feeling and throw stuff away, pretty soon their house will be empty. And neurologically, it's the same mechanism. And, you know, if you look at these in terms of what our neurophysiology does and our, and our blood chemistry does, instead of giving it uh, metaphorical significance, uh, coming up with complex things and thoughts and theories to defend, uh, I'm lucky I have nothing to defend. I only try stuff and it either works or it doesn't. And with phobias, we found lots of things that work really well. So we're done with that. We can move on, teach other people to be able to do it. Uh, when they brought me kids that couldn't spell, I didn't look at them and their personal history. I went to spelling bees and found people who won the spelling bees and found out that they looked at words and then made the letters 16 inches big in their head so that they could read them forwards and backwards. They didn't do it phonetically. They did it with eidetic visual memory. Mm -hmm. And when you teach kids to do that, after a while it happens automatically and they spell really well. Excellent. Uh, they did the Durham project here in England where uh, some people, not myself, but other people went in and trained teachers for a couple of days, and they measured the results, and almost all the student scores improved by 30%. Wow. And so the problem is not with the teachers. The problem is what we're teaching our teachers. Uh, the problem is that we keep thinking we can throw money into an organization and it's going to function better. But the only thing that makes an organization function better is more skills. Uh, in the United States, they were going to have health care for everybody, but they weren't going to add any doctors. It just doesn't make sense. We have to figure out how to meet the needs of, of people, whether they're in mental hospitals or physical hospitals or schools, or they're studying to do gymnastics in the Olympics. We have to give them better ways of thinking so they can learn faster and accomplish more. Absolutely. The results that you have seen have been groundbreaking. They really have. And absolutely awesome stuff. Um, you said that you've worked with doctors, psychologists and hospitals. Um, where do you see the future of NLP? Well, I don't think about it. I think about what I'm going to do. I don't think about NLP. It's not alive. It's not a person. It's not a single organization. It's the name I gave to the tools I created. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of people doing NLP that I don't even approve of what they do. Uh, what I do is I, I, I do things like the last book I wrote was called The Secrets of Being Happy. Yes. And uh, I decided that there are far too many grumpy people on the planet. So I approach the problem by going and finding the people who deal with things well so they're most cheerful and the most happy and find out how they think about it in a way that makes sense. And then literally put down a bunch of exercises that people could practice so that they could get better at happily doing things. 
uh, to me, this is where I see the future of my own activities. I don't look at NLP as if it's alive. It's not a person. <laughs> True. Okay, so you, you've got your latest books, um, the latest book, The Secrets of Being Happy. Um, it's out now on www.nlplifetraining.com under the product section. If any of our listeners today want to actually go and purchase it, that would be the best place to go and buy it. Um, you also have your website, Richard, which is www.richardbandler.com. And for later seminar information, it would be www.nlplifetraining.com. Dot com. So if you're interested in attending a seminar with Richard, whether that's in London or Brighton or America or wherever the world, please do check out those websites. He runs amazing seminars where people have achieved phenomenal results. I r encourage you to go and attend one. It will be life-changing. So thank you very much, Richard, for being on our show today. It was my pleasure. It's been a great honor. And um, thank you very much. And I wish you a wonderful evening. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.